Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, in the sports section, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News, on iTunes, Dwyer Boxing News, one word. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, people may remember that it was Jermaine Taylor that took Bernard Hopkins' title many years ago. That fight so big looms so large, especially now that Hopkins is the light heavyweight champion, that I believe Jermaine Taylor is overrated. I'm expecting Sam Solomon to thoroughly outbox Jermaine Taylor. Make him look bad for a host of reasons when they fight for the middleweight title a few weeks from now. Let's talk about them. Now first, let's be blunt. There's the neurological factor. Okay, let me back up a little bit. Right? You recently saw Sergio Martinez get stopped by Miguel Cotto. Right in a fight in which Martinez hit the canvas several times. He got hit hard. Right? That was a fight that I thought Martinez was going to win. I was wrong about that fight. Right? That fight still surprises me. Let me say this, though. Understand that Sergio Martinez, despite hitting the canvas several times, was lucid. He was talking. He retired on his stool. Right? He was able to talk with the media right after the fight. He talked with his trainer, a superstar trainer, Pablo Sarmiento. Right? You got the feeling watching the fight that Martinez's body, namely his knee, betrayed him. Right? Martinez had had a knee injury and had undergone surgery, his knee problems were documented. Now, even though Martinez got stopped in the fight, because Martinez is always lucid in the fight, because he's able to give an interview after the fight, right? I don't question Martinez's neurological condition, even though he got stopped. Knockouts happen. There's some days when you're going to face a guy with a great left hook who is able to land it and drop you. Right? So it goes. But that's very different than what happened to Jermaine Taylor in 2009. Right? Understand, he first gets stopped by Carl Frotch. Right? And he looked exhausted and he looked bad at the end of that fight. Now this was after Taylor had built up a reputation of fading late in fights. Understand both Bernard Hopkins bouts Taylor dampens a bit as the fight goes on. Well then he fought Arthur Abraham and he gets knocked out in a way that Sergio Martinez has never been knocked out, right? He gets knocked out in a way that's downright scary, right? Scary. He's not lucid at the end of the fight. He can't give coherent interviews at the end of the fight. People who love him, his promoter, Lou DiBella, questioned whether he should continue in the sport. The knockout was that bad, right? He had to take time away from the sport. We later found out he had bleeding on the brain. Now, I know this was 2009. I know there's the argument out there that enough time has passed where he's fully recovered. Hasn't he beaten credible fighters like Caleb Truex, right? That's the argument. I don't buy the argument. I trust my eyes. 
Taylor since that devastating knockout by Arthur Abraham. Right shortly after, he was stopped by Carl Frotch. Doesn't look the same to me. Right? Well, fans of Sergio Martinez can say, hey, you know what? Sergio physically wasn't 100%. That knee seemed to click a little bit against Cotto. He didn't seem to have the same movement. Taylor has no such alibis. Right? He got hit. He got stopped. It was a bad stoppage. Right? He was unconscious. You knew the fight was over the minute he hit the canvas. Right? This wasn't a situation where he's talking with his trainer in the corner like Sergio Martinez was, and then they decide to end the fight Sergio was losing badly in. This wasn't that. This was a guy getting stopped, getting knocked out. Now, understand I have further questions about Taylor. I believe the blueprint for this fight is actually a fight I thought Taylor lost by a wide margin in 2007 against a fighter named Corey Spinks. Now that fight has always bothered me because I thought Taylor won by a, excuse me, I thought Spinks won by a wide margin. Right? Taylor was the favorite fighter back then, right? Taylor was the hot name in the sport back then. I thought Corey Spinks dominated him. Now, I wasn't alone. One judge had Corey Spinks winning that fight 117-111. Now, this is two years before the Arthur Abraham KO. Right? I didn't think Taylor moved around the ring well. One judge had Corey Spinks in a 12-round fight winning by six rounds in what I consider one of the biggest scoring travesties I have ever encountered. One judge curiously had Taylor winning the fight by six rounds. The third judge had Taylor winning the fight by something like two rounds. Taylor escaped with his title. I thought it was a farce. Right? I thought Taylor had a problem with a guy who could move. This is before the issues he had with Abraham. This was Taylor in his prime. Not Taylor post-Abraham. Where, in my opinion, he's past his prime. Now let's be clear on what I mean when I say past his prime. I'm not just going by chronological age, because some guys, like Wine, are better as they get older. I would argue that Vladimir Klitschko today is better than he was at 30. Right? Much better, in fact. Right? Just look at Vladimir Klitschko against Lehman Brewster. Right? If you want to roll the clock back further, look at Vladimir Klitschko against Ross Purity. I believe Vladimir Klitschko today beats the Vladimir Klitschko of those years, right? So I would argue that Vladimir Klitschko is around his prime today. Now, when it comes to Jermaine Taylor, I would argue that the Taylor of today loses badly to the Taylor who beat Bernard Hopkins twice. In other words, that Taylor is years ago. Taylor in his prime is the Taylor that existed before he fought Kelly Pavlik the first time. In my opinion, about the only thing in common this Jermaine Taylor has with that Jermaine Taylor is the name, right? Now, I thought that Jermaine Taylor, the Taylor who's closer to his prime, had a problem with movement. Let's be clear here. Neither Carl Frotch, nor Arthur Abraham, nor Kelly Pavlik, for that matter, were movers. Right? These are guys who were pretty much in front of you. Styles make fights. Corey Spinks was a mover, like Sam Solomon. Right? He moves around the ring. Corey Spinks was shorter than Taylor, like Sam Solomon. The angle set up by Corey Spinks made it hard for Taylor to land his jab. 
just like Sam Solomon made it hard for Felix Sturm to land his jab. And because I really question Taylor's stamina, right, let's remember, Taylor faded against Frotch in a fight he was winning. Let's remember, Taylor faded against Arthur Abraham. And that was Taylor when he was closer to his prime. Because I question Taylor's stamina as well as his neurological condition. And I know he's passed all the tests. I understand that. I know he looks good on an MRI and all of that. Great. You know, maybe these tests and maybe these MRIs, etc., don't fully tell the entire story. Maybe the world of medicine is evolving over time and we're just now learning that football helmets, for example, don't fully protect you from concussions or from post-concussion syndrome down the road. Right? I look at Taylor and he doesn't move as well to me. I look at Taylor and, you know, he doesn't seem as coordinated to me as he did in the past, right? Part of it is Father Time. He's 36 years old. As I like to say, Father Time is really the only undisputed, unbeaten champion in the history of boxing, right? There's no, there's no question that Father Time's unbeaten, right? There are no Roland Lestarza fights. There are no um, Castillo fights in uh, Father Time's background. Right? Father Time pretty much can say, I've beaten everyone. Right? None of us live forever. Taylor's 36 years old. But in my opinion, he's an old 36. Right? Unlike Solomon, who I know is 40. But Solomon is a very young 40. Right? Dare I say, an argument can be made that Sam Solomon at 40, like Vladimir Klitschko in his late 30s, is just now hitting his prime. Right? He's looked good of late. Like Corey Spinks, he moves around the ring. There's a dynamic in boxing that stats don't really quantify properly. And it's the ability to fake a guy out of his shoes. How do you put a statistic on that? You know, head fakes. 20. You know, Sam Solomon, like Corey Spinks, can literally fake you almost out of your shoes, right? It's hard to quantify good timing. Sam Solomon has it, right? The guy he's fighting always looks mid-tempo, looks out of rhythm, right? Sam Solomon seems to dictate the tempo. Now, you can imagine that's tough against fighters in their prime. A fighter a bit out of his prime, who doesn't have great stamina, is really going to be faked out of his shoes. Isn't he? Right? I don't expect Sam Solomon to knock out Jermaine Taylor. I do expect him, though, to methodically outbox Jermaine Taylor. Right? I think you're going to see the sweet science here on display. Solomon is a bit different. He's not a traditional boxer. right? He's kind of like Miguel Vasquez, the great, and I do use the word great, lightweight champ, who just seems to be able to change cadence and tempo on demand. Right? Who just seems to change tempo in such a way where you're asking yourself how his opponent could be having an off night. Right? I'm sure there are many who looked at the Felix Sturm fights and who thought, wow, you know, Sturm just looks neutralized. Something's wrong with Felix Sturm. Well, something was wrong with Felix Sturm. It was Sam Solomon. Solomon was his problem. Solomon's a guy who's able to change the cadence of the fight through fakes and positioning, right, and body language, things you really can't quantify. Then Solomon was able to come in and counter. Then at times he's able to come in and lead. 
and the other fighter's timing is so destroyed, they're not even prepared to block the shots. Now here, Jermaine Taylor's calling card is a great jab. Right? Against less mobile opponents, people who don't have the foot speed of a Corey Spinks or of a Sam Solomon, that jab keeps them away. Taylor's then able to bust you up with the jab. Right? You really have to come up with ways to get around the jab. He, he was able to keep Bernard Hopkins outside of the jab. He was able to keep Kelly Pavlik outside of the jab in the first fight until he gets stopped. Right? The problem is when that jab can't land against a mobile fighter, when a mobile fighter isn't sticking around to get hit with the jab, and when the mobile fighter has developed slickness, like Corey Spinks, like Sam Solomon, and is actually using the jab as a timing mechanism on when to come in with counters, Jermaine Taylor, in my opinion, doesn't have a plan B. If he can't land that jab, I don't believe he can land power punches. Taylor is not as mobile as you think. He doesn't marry the jab to movement like, let's say, an Ali. Right? It's a great jab, but Taylor's in front of you. Right? So I'm expecting Taylor's age to show against a fighter who is four years older than him. I'm expecting Taylor to have a hard time keeping up with the foot speed of Sam Solomon. I'm expecting Solomon to circle him, and I'm expecting a repeat of the Corey Spinks fight, where I had Spinks winning by a lot of rounds, and one judge had him winning by six rounds. I like Sam Solomon in this fight to successfully defend his title. I think Solomon is using... Jermaine Taylor's name to convince the public that this is a competitive fight, I don't believe it is. Right? Just like milk cartons have expiration dates, unfortunately fighters really have expiration dates on their presence as world-class fighters. Right? Many guys stop being world-class years ago but they still have the name and we still have the memories right you think Jermaine Taylor and you're thinking oh that's right Taylor gave Carl Frotch who's currently the super middleweight champion all he could handle we forget that Taylor fought Frotch in 2009 we say hey Taylor gave Bernard Hopkins the light heavyweight champion, all he could handle, twice. And we forget that those fights took place even before the Carl Frotch fight. Folks, look at the calendar on the wall. It's 2014, right? Who are the big names Taylor has beaten in the last four years, right? Taylor's a big name. He has had big moments in the ring years ago not now I'm expecting the current champ to defend his title in an outbox Jermaine Taylor I don't expect Sam Solomon to be in front of Taylor to allow Taylor to hit him with his jab I think you'll know by the third round that Taylor's having all kinds of problems landing his jab I'm guessing by the eighth or ninth round Taylor, simply put, is going to run out of gas against a fighter who has gone the distance many times. I'm expecting a successful title defense by Sam Solomon. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. If I were to hedge the play, I would hedge it with Taylor by KO. As odd as this sounds knowing that Taylor has beaten Hopkins by decision. The outcome I'm eliminating here, and knowing that Taylor was ahead on the scorecards against Carl Frotch literally well into the 12th round. Right? The outcome I'm eliminating here, oddly enough, is Taylor by decision. 
right? This is high risk. I like Sam Solomon to win the fight. I'd hedge to play with Taylor by KO. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.